Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. On the Logistics of Logistics, I talk to experts in logistics and transportation, warehousing, fulfillment, supply chain, and of course, technology. And during these interviews, I'm always the one asking the dumb questions. I ask the dumb questions so you don't have to. Today's topic is the freight brokerage market with my friend Kevin Hill. Kevin is the founder of Brush Pass Research. At Brush Pass, they develop sales intelligence on decision makers at the largest freight brokers. In our conversation, Kevin shares some of his insights on the freight brokerage space. Kevin has some really interesting things to share, so check out my interview with Kevin Hill. How's it going, Kevin? I'm doing great, Joe. It's always great to, to, to see you and, and talk to you. We, we had a great uh, great conversation before we even jumped on, on the record button. And uh, and being on the Logistics of Logistics podcast, it was the first podcast I was ever on in my life. Yeah, and that was, by the way, that was my second podcast, but we'll come back to that in a second. So, Kev, please introduce yourself and your company and where you're calling from today. Yeah, my name is Kevin Hill. I am in Fort Worth, Texas today, and my company is a new venture that I'm in the middle of launching, and that's called Brush Pass Research. And it's a crazy name. I got tired of all the logistics names, so decided to do something a a little bit different. But what we do is sells intel on the freight brokerage market, and that comes from uh, records, contact database, plus uh, intel on what freight brokers just do and, and what technology they use. Excellent. Excellent. I know I met you, let's see, longer than five, more than five years ago, but about five years ago, I launched a little longer than five years ago. I launched the Logistics of Logistics and you were my second guest. And at that time you owned a company called Carrierless. I, and I remember you told me something that I thought was really interesting at that time. You told me that the very best content written video podcast is research and you had lots of research and that time that was a carrier list of all of the carriers out there and it was an enormous list so before you were counting carriers now you're not just counting carriers but getting gaining intelligence on them but now it's all about the brokers it, it is right so i, I did carry a list uh, as a freight broker frustrated with not about being able to find capacity. So started calling carriers, finding out what they did, what kind of equipment they ran, hired a team of people to do that. And it's an enormous list, right? It's up to about 15 or 20,000 carriers focused on a, a very specific segment of that because there's 250,000 carriers or 200,000 carriers out there running. And you can't talk to them all. So you have to, to find where you can get the biggest bang for your buck and doing Kind of the same thing for the freight brokerage industry. I, I sold that product to freight brokers and got really familiar with that industry and now putting some research and some numbers behind it. But research really is the best content and the best content out there, indexes, things like that. But I call it slide deck marketing or pitch deck marketing, right? You want to create research and content that shows up on your customers and your competitors and everybody in the industry in their slide decks, their sales presentations, their fundraising presentations. You want to be that expert. And I, I think that that marketing goes a long way. Yep. Who do you sell to at Brush Pass Research? Really anyone selling into the freight brokerage through 3PLs, freight brokerages, but really a lot of that is freight tech, right? You're you're developing software solutions for the 3PL industry, the freight brokerage industry, the freight forwarding industry, and you need basically a CRM. You need a CRM. You need that data for your CRM, for your SDRs, your salespeople to go out there and very quickly set up demos, get in front of people, build relationships. Typically, the salespeople do that. It takes months, if not years, to, to build up a complete database of who you need to be talking to. And with Brush Pass Research, you can have it in a, in a mouse click, actually. Very nice. Very nice. It's an interesting thought because not so long ago, you could have said some to somebody, I have a list of all the freight brokers that'd be like, yawn, <laughs> like who cares, right? Now we know our freight brokers are getting more sophisticated. They're using technology and the expectations from shippers has gotten higher and higher. And the idea of I'll get you a truck, still important, but it's 
only part of what we expect from our freight broker now. Now we expect them to be industry experts, market experts, technology experts. They are bringing so much more. The most sophisticated ones are bringing so much more. And they're a lot of the top freight brokers are huge companies now. They're Fortune 500, right? You're exactly right. The, getting a truck is table stakes. Getting a truck and full visibility integrations, being a real partner in, in, in the shipper's dashboard, if you say, is the most important thing right now. And the, the great thing about that, though, is that if you're a smaller brokerage, you can buy the, the tools that you need off the shelf now from different vendors put it together and you've replicated what the largest three peels out there have done building their own spending a ton of money it's all SaaS products now which is a game changer and exciting for the industry and you can see it with all the freight tech companies popping up yeah and when you say SaaS, that's software as a service or you sometimes see s-a-a-s and for those who are not software people what you mean is I don't have to buy the software up front and download it uh, with disks or anything, or even from the internet. I I get a code when I buy it, and it's, it updates on a regular basis, so I don't have to manage it at my location. The updates happen automatically, and you don't have that big investment up front, which used to be such a, a deterrent to buying. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, it cost $100,000 and then $1,000 a month for maintenance or for whatever. Now it's just, we'll give it to you for $1,000 a month or $1,500 or whatever it is. Anyway, uh, Kev, let's switch gears for a sec. Tell us a little bit about you. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Give us some career highlights before you started Brush Pass Research. Yes, I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, or just outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma, in a, in a, a town. At that time, it was a pretty small town, Owasso, Oklahoma. It's, it's a big suburb now of of Tulsa. It was a good childhood, played a lot of baseball, hunted, fished, and just played around and went to OU after that. And then I always nice. wanted to see the world. Yeah, you know, boomer sooner. So I always wanted to see the world. So I moved around a little bit, lived in New Orleans for a little bit. And in my 30s, ended up in New York, where I sold marketing, advertising, research, basically, for financial publications. And then the financial crisis hit, came back to Oklahoma, did an MBA at OU, went back to school. And and after that, it was still in that murky period and, and got a job as a, at a 3PL as a freight broker. And it was the most frustrating job I ever had, but also one of the most rewarding, right? Transportation is not for the faint of heart, especially brokerage 10 years ago. I did that and then started Carrier List and then got into the doing my content marketing, ran into Craig Fuller and became director of research over at Freight Waves in 2019. And then ran the media operations for a, a couple of years as well back during the pandemic, which is in the rear view mirror now. It's not present tense, it's past tense, which is great. But yeah, just recently came out there, but I host Put That Coffee Down podcast for, I don't know, three and a half years. I think I have over 200 episodes where we talk about freight sales and logistics. So it's been a, a great career in transportation. Yep. Yep. And so why did you start Brush Pass? What did you, what hole did you see in the market? Well, I think, I think being a sales podcaster, the big hole is, and this is something that Carrie Lewis had this philosophy as well. And it's my philosophy is salespeople should be on the phone or in person selling not looking for leads, not looking for people to call. I, I think a salesperson's time consumed with that part of the research, figuring out the market, figuring out who, trying to hunt down someone's phone number or email address to, to get in front of them, consumes too, way too much of their time, right? If, if they already have that information there ready to go, that means more phone calls, more meetings, more demos. And Joe, you know exactly what that means. At the end of the day, it means more sales. Yep. And before we hit record, you and I were talking about the idea of being an expert in this space versus a sales guy. And again, not so long ago, just getting a truck was good enough. And again, as you mentioned, that's table stakes and still super important. You couldn't convince anybody during the pandemic that was an easy thing or that the shippers overlooked it. <laughs> we... It mattered very much. Getting the the right truck for the right price was super important. But we come to expect so much more from our freight brokers. 
And I feel, and, and again, the vast majority of people I do, I think, I believe are very honest, but freight brokers didn't always have the sterling reputation that I think it has now. This double brokering and some other stuff has given us a little bit of a black eye, but I feel like in the olden days, not so long ago, this was an overlooked area that kind of had almost like a schlocky feel to it. Again, not for legitimate reasons in my mind, because it was the vast majority of people doing the right things, getting trucks. But now it's like the bar just got really high. And when you walk through a freight brokerage now, you're like, oh my God, these are techies. And they move trucks. They move trucks when they get a minute, but they're technologists. It's the world has really changed. And I think the shippers have such higher expectations for the market now. That they do. And I got into the business in 2012, so about 11 years ago. And and you, you didn't want to call anybody and say, oh yeah, I'm a broker. Because it, it did, it had some kind of connotation to it that was not all, a little bit seedy almost. It's, I only work oh, with yeah. asset based. I only work with asset based. So I'm like, all right. Yeah, that, that's right. And I don't think that's as true. I don't think so either. I remember calling somebody and said, they said, do you own your own trucks? And you say, no, click. <laughs> they would just yeah, hang yeah. up on you. <laughs> Dude, I got this three, I, we've got uh, a TMS and we give reports. Nope, none of it. You don't own your own trucks. But now I think the market is accepting that we're not just some middleman that doesn't add value. They're looking and saying, no. The reason I'm hiring this freight broker is because not only did they get me trucks, they brought us technology that streamlined the process, They're probably auditing the freight bills. They are keeping us compliant with all the laws. They are sharing information with us that we wouldn't have otherwise. And um, by the way, I was talking to somebody not so long ago about an implementation with a new customer. And the customer was saying, do you think, what if they get behind? I said, they won't get behind, you will. <laughs> I said, the freight brokers of today, the more sophisticated ones, are really good at implementations, really good at technology. So it's usually the shippers who say, oh, well, will you be able to do this? You're like, what are you kidding me? I've got a whole tech stack here. I I do this every week. (laughs) You're doing it once every five years. No, I get this. (laughs) Yeah, it's almost like technology company, light technology, asset light technology companies, as 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 the vernacular goes these days. You you have to have that nimbleness, and I, I think the, the larger players have figured it out as well. Is whether because you, you take an asset based fleet, right? Five thousand trucks, whatever, a thousand trucks, and shippers don't want just a carrier. They want a full suite solution. They, they want a, a carrier. They want a brokerage. They want warehousing. They want freight forwarding. And they want the technology to seamlessly put all those together out of their vendor. So just being carrier only, uh, I don't think really works these days. And you can see that in the business models of those, um, those, those say, top 100 carriers, right? Yeah. So that's the business model that they had, the, the one I just laid out. And if you're just a 3PL, you need warehousing, you need that, that WMS, you need the TMS, you need the whole alphabet uh, of everything and offer more than getting a truck. Yeah. I want to take a quick time out to tell you, you can now listen to the logistics of logistics on Wreaths Across America Radio. I'll put a link in the show notes. Wreaths Across America provides informational, inspiring content about members of the U.S. Armed Forces, their families and military veterans. Their mission is to remember, honor, and teach. Wreaths Across America succeeds because of the generous support of the trucking community. Take a listen and please consider volunteering. So getting back to it, that's where the world has changed so much as before it was, are you asset or are you non-asset? And now that line has blurred as, and by the way, I came from automotive as we've talked about this before. I came from automotive and I just would say, I I guess we would work with a trucking company. Trucking companies and only the largest trucking companies can manage for a, a Fortune 500 company the whole na- the nationwide shipping. Most of them are really good in a region, and they would say we're really good in a region, and we use our brokerage side to manage the rest. And I did work at a trucking company, and I remember 
the good thing about calling on sales is when you say, yeah, we have our own trucks. And I, what I never said is, but they're all dedicated to certain customers and we'll never yeah. move your freight with them. <laughs> but anyway, let's talk about that freight brokerage market. On my podcast, I talk to lots of people, lots of smart people like you, Kevin. And somebody said not too long ago to me, oh, there's 17,000 freight brokers. And then somebody else said, nope, there's 20,000. And then somebody said there's 22,000. How many freight brokers are there, Kevin Hill? And I need an exact number. number. I, you know what? I do have an exact number somewhere here that are active in the FMCSA as of January of, of this year. I haven't seen it since then, but there's roughly 27,000. 27,000? 27,000 active MCs. Now, what does that actually mean? Because they have active MCs in the FMCSA. First, explain all of those acronyms you used. Yeah, so motor carrier number, if you're a commercial carrier asset based or property boat broker, as they say, you have to you have to register with the FMCSA. You have to have insurance on file. There's some very requirements. So all the trucking companies out there have an MC number, and that's a motor carrier number. And it just means that you're a commercial carrier instead of, say, if you're Walmart and you have your own fleet, but you don't handle anyone else's, then you don't have to have an MC number. Of course, Walmart's fleet does have an MC number because they do carrier, that they do some commercial carrier operations, right? And if you're interstate, that, that's all interstate carriers that, that we're talking about. So freight brokers have to have an MC number? They do, yeah. So the, it's a it's an MC number that's a property broker is what they call it, right? But it's still an yep. MC number. It's separate. You have to have insurance on file, bond on file, I believe. So now this is where it gets a little tricky. Not so long ago, freight brokers seem to be usually a, an entity that was just a freight broker. Now there's a, as I mentioned earlier, a blurred line where a lot of maybe a warehousing company, the warehousing and fulfillment says, we also do enough freight that we decided to get it, our own MC number and become a freight broker. A lot of trucking companies made a lot of sense. They also said, you know what? We need back calls. Uh, we need back calls. We need to cover additional lanes that we're not good at or we choose not to invest in. So they got it. And so now there's 27,000. But break that down for us because it can't be 27,000 that are all the same. I know they have, I know, I know you have segments for us, Kev. Uh, of course, <laughs> delving into this data, putting together this big list, you get great insights out of it. And one of those, if you look at the top 100 3PLs in transport topics, you add up all those estimated revenues, you get a number, right? And that number of the domestic domestic transportation market, a managed transportation, as Armstrong and Associates calls it, right? It grew from about $87, $88 billion in 2019 to $160 billion. So that market's doubled. And a lot of that has to do with COVID and these high rates everybody was paying probably come back down to earth uh, starting in this next year. But you take 160 billion, you add up the top 100, you're going to get about 80 to $90 billion right there. So there's top 100 freight brokerages, those three PLs account for somewhere between 50 and 60% of the market. So the top 100 of those 27,000 make up 50 to 60% of the market. Now that would be, and that some of them, I don't, think it uh, people don't know these companies it would be the ch robinson's of the world tql it would be rxo jb hunt yeah spi logistics they were just on my podcast there and that there's a lot of recognizable names but i guarantee even people in the business would not be able to name the top 100 great brokers because this industry flies a little bit under the radar and and i always say we also have so many names like Oh, we'll open a company, call it Standard or a Universal or American. <laughs> like, I know, right? But they all run in together. The names just, are a lot alike. Yeah, that's right. Again, then we merged. Now we're American Standard Universal. Um, and so the top 100 do 50 to 60% of the volume. So that leaves uh, 26,000 some <laughs> that, that are not it doing does. all that. So talk about the next segment below the top 100. So the next segment, I'll call it the next 900, right? And that is, there's a segment in there called what I call the mid cap. And that's 50 to $100 million in revenue. And then you have the growth cap, which is 10 to $50 million in revenue. 
but you, you take 900, maybe there's 1,200 out of there. That's a unknowable number two. These are all ballpark figures. If you take, that's another 25% of the market right there. You do the math, right? It's 25% of the market. And that gets you up to about 80, 85% of that $160 billion number is in those top, say, 1,000 to 1,500 freight brokerages. Wow. So that leaves not much for those other 20,000 freight brokerages out there. Not to say that's not good, but it's important to, to realize that. If you look at $1 to $10 million in gross revenue per year, you're looking 2,500, 3,000, 3,500, somewhere in that neighborhood. And then everybody else is doing less than a million. Yeah. And we'll get to what the other 26,000 are up to, but for what you do at Brush Pass Research, if somebody says, I want to sell very expensive, high-end freight tech stuff, TMS. They're not going to sell it to the bottom of the market. They're going to sell it. And by the way, there's lower price transportation management systems, but there's also the very yeah. expensive stuff. And also you mentioned ERP, maybe a, a smaller, I don't have an ERP at my little company. I don't need it. But if um, you get to a certain size, you need an ERP. So I think if somebody says, I want to sell ERP to the transportation or the freight brokerage market, they're going to sell to the top 1000 probably top, maybe top 2000. But we look at the, again, the top 1000 to 1500 have about 85% of the market. Good to know. But this is where it gets a little tricky. A lot of the freight brokers out there are affiliated with carriers. Maybe they're just like a sister company or in the same company. Am I right to say that? You're very right to say that. Yeah. So there could be a company like, so you they could be a very large company that you recognize the name. I'll think of Ruan Trucking. Ruan Trucking has a ton of trucks. They have warehouses and they have a freight brokerage. They have managed trans. They would not lead. They, I think they call themselves Ruan Transportation at this point. So there's a lot of very good, sophisticated companies that are not in that. Maybe they're not the top freight brokerage, but they might be a top trucking company. Yes, I, I almost all of them, right? If you get up to a certain size the, 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 as a trucking company, or you were mentioning it before, is that we're really good at here, but we have this overflow freight from our natural customers. Our trucking customers need servicing. Maybe it's different modes. Maybe it's different regions. Maybe it's different specializations. I'm going to get, I'm going to set up a brokerage, right? And that brokerage could be doing $5 million a year. It could be doing 20 million. It could be doing $40 million and not really doing any outside sales or marketing, growing that brokerage. It's there to service the, the trucking company. And if that trucking company is using X TMS, that broker is using the same TMS. And, and that's just the way it is. And they're not really looking to grow aggressively. They're not like your young gun up and comer, the 3PL that, that we read about in freight waves and, and everything else. And it's just a slow, steady business that services their existing customers and generates some really good cash for them at, at the, the end of the year. So I, I would, so it's hard to say, maybe this is the next question I really answer is how many of the, the large trucking fleets have brokerages attached? And I would say it's 80, 90% at least. So there is a there's another chunk here bo below the top one thousand that are still maybe owns a billion dollar trucking company. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. Oh yeah, and they're growing their freight brokerage, but and maybe they're growing it aggressively. But who knows? It's a little it's a, gets a little murky. I'm sure there's there's everything under the rainbow in that. Well, in warehousing companies, right? You mentioned that before. There's probably below that top one thousand. Let's say. So there's probably a lot of warehouse companies and people that maybe a freight forwarder, right? Who's doing domestic truckload and they're doing it as needed instead of we're going to invest all this money into it. And we are going to grow aggressively at 20% a year and get to this point. It's just a part of their normal operations. It made sense for them to say, Hey, let, let's open up brokerage, have a couple of people whenever we need trucks. There it is. Right. 
Yeah, this it's hard. It's hard when you start categorizing things. That's what we need you, Kev, because you're good at categorizing. <laughs> that, is, that is your gift. And I think, as we talked earlier, there's a lot of companies that are see, seeing this huge market that has traditionally been underserved and saying, how do we get in there? And then you mentioned transport topics. There's companies like transport topics, freight waves, others that have tremendous data. But is that enough? You get the top 100 and say, there you go. There's my CRM. It's a starting point, but it's not nearly enough. It's not enough insights. And Armstrong, I think, probably has some really good data too. But it's but this is why we need brush pass because this is a critical thing for an industry is for the rest of the world to recognize it and want to, to work with it. We were, again, somewhat ignored by technologists for a long time. And now they're clamoring, saying, how do I get, how do I get into that market? They need tech. But they do need tech. And then there's, there's been such a boom over the last five or six, seven years uh, of technology coming in. And then we have a new wave. Of, everyone's talking about AI now and how to apply that and how to do more and more automations of manual tasks uh, that we have in transportation. And we have a lot of manual tasks in, in the space. So there's a lot of funding that you know, even in this down year of 2023, the, the funding down round, there's still a lot of people getting funding. There's still a lot of startups coming together and trying to solve these little issues in 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 transportation as a whole, but certainly in, in freight brokerage and 3PL and democratizing that. And so just, it's important that, that the technology people aren't necessarily salespeople. And, and I, I think you can agree with this, Joe, is... And, and it's a good question to ask, right? Is it harder to build the product than it is to sell it? Is it more? It's just as hard to go out and market the the best mousetrap out there. Something that has clear competitive advantages. It's still a very difficult job of going out there and hitting the floor and doing the sales, doing the marketing, getting it out there. So if you're really good at building product, not necessarily means that that you're ready to roll out and sell at scale. Yes, yes. I want to take a quick time out to tell you about my friends over at Green Screens. That's greenscreens.ai. Green Screens is a dynamic pricing technology for the truckload spot market that delivers buy and sell side market intelligence to help brokers and 3PLs grow and protect their margins. Freight brokers and 3PLs using Green Screens gain the following advantages. Faster pricing for both buy side and sell side transactions. Pricing that is more accurate and more likely to win profitable business. Guys, dynamic pricing is the next killer app. Hundreds of freight brokers are already using it because it enables them to develop faster, more accurate quotes. This is the time. Check out Green Screens in the show notes, greenscreens.ai. So getting back to it, we did, didn't talk about them, and I think we'd be remiss if we didn't. Probably also not in this top 1,000, maybe some aren't, is we've seen a whole bunch of tech-centric brokerages start up, and they started with VC money. That would be Uber. I'm sure they're in that top one, the top list. Convoy. I'm assuming they made that list. But I think there's others like Transfix. They probably made the list. Flock Freight. We see a lot of companies that are, have started and... They said, we're going to start as a tech, really tech-centric company, very different than maybe, this is no slam, but the traditional freight broker that started 20 years ago didn't start with tech because it wasn't any tech to start with. They adopted it over time. And then you had different kind of a different group that said, hey, we're going to start with venture capital money and we are going to be heavy on tech, hopefully real efficient. Maybe we'll need less headcount. And so they aren't on this list. Uh, some of them aren't. Some are. And so this is so when somebody says, "Oh, there's only th the the top fifteen hundred are all you should care about." No, not necessarily, because there's going to be those other guys with a very compelling sales pitch, and you might say that fits us. That those guys right there, they aren't as big, but my God, I love their tech. It's yeah, and, and it's that philosophy of, of automation and technology. All the new brokerages that are popped up that are, are made to, to grow are using technology, maybe not to the, the extent as a convoy and Uber or Transfix, Load Smarts, Flock Freights of the world. 
but they are using new technology and or technology in new ways as well to do a hybrid model of that and addressing different parts of the market. And you see these these entrepreneurs pop up all the time. And they're usually coming from if you think back in the back haulers and the Coyote, right? Access America. Once those were sold and they got to a certain size, they were sold and everything. People left and started that same model over and over again, that that legacy. And we're starting to see that now, too, is people leaving the digital freight brokerages. And that's going to accelerate over the next couple of years in taking what they learned there and putting their own spin on it. But it's going to be technology first for different areas of the market. And this is the the, the new wave over the next decade. That's this is what's going to happen. Right. I just talked to Brian Kempesty from Portex Logistics. Now, they are, they, they, again, they're one of those companies where you go, oh, well, they're they wouldn't be in the top 100. Great company, many locations. They serve every single railhead, every single port in Canada and the US. And if I got stuff coming off boats, I might say, I don't care if they're the top 100 company. They are really good at technology. They use Turbo, but they've got some other tech in addition to it. They got their own trucks, they got warehouses, and they have expertise. They've got a great culture over there. So I look at, again, when you have categories, it adds a lot of value. So I, again, I can look and say 85% of the business is done by these top 1,000 or 1,500. But there's a lot of people who say, I don't care. I want the port X's of the world because they do what I need. And by the way, there's also people who have specializations. I know, I think we talked before about you did, when you were a freight broker, you did a lot of flatbed stuff out of Mexico, right? oil field, right? And if you say, hey, I don't know and I don't care how big my freight broker is because they do cold chain or oil field or automotive or some specialized truck that, and they do it better. And I like the culture. I like the people I work with. I don't care about the size. This is what I want. Yeah, you're exactly right. Right, size doesn't matter all that much to to, to certain situations in shipper, and certainly not saying that that size makes you a, a better brokerage. We have those twenty thousand. I, I call them lifestyle brokers, right? Because if you're doing under a million dollars in gross revenue, you're making a nice living. But if you can do that at home, why not? I always say that if somebody making a million bucks and they live down the street, be like, I don't know what that guy does, but he's killing it, and and then. Kev, you and I end up talking to people who like, oh, okay, that guy probably made $100 million. And you're like, it's, it's, it's like surreal where you go, that guy only has $20 million. <laughs> like, like, he's still living indoors and eating every day. I'm not worried yeah, for yeah. him. Not worried about him at all. But yeah, so it's a great lifestyle business. But if you're selling technology and, and you built something, ERP, TMR, TMS, something that, that needs a number of different seats, maybe 15 seats, 10 seats, and lower than that, your economics breaks down. You need to be focusing on those brokerages that have more than 10 seats to, to offer than someone at their kitchen table or maybe a, a truckload or an asset base with a couple of brokers doing overflow. You, you have to know what you're, you're going after. Yep. I, I love what you're doing because I, I know you're relatively new but you already have some very interesting insights. And these insights are necessary for our industry to get the right attention from these companies. And before we hit record, I was talking about Green Screens. That's Dynamic Pricing. They're one of my sponsors. They've been on the podcast a few times. And they sell uh, dynamic pricing either to freight brokers. They have over 100. And they also sell it to the transportation management systems. And there are more and more what I'll call killer apps uh, that are want to connect to your TMS, want to sell to brokers. All those visibility companies, the Four Kites, the uh, Four Kites, MacroPoint, P44, those all kind of popped up and they became integral and they want to know who are the freight brokers, who are the 3PLs, who, how do I get a hold of these guys? All these transportation, I had a friend of mine say, probably two or three years ago. He said, Joe, I think there's more transportation management systems than there are freight brokers right now. <laughs> and But th- there's a reason. There, there's all sorts of specializations. 
I think as you go forward, you're going to get more and more insights that you'll be able to provide to your customers. So by the way, getting back to it, who is the sweet spot for you? Who are your customers? My customer, I, I think freight tech companies, certainly anyone doing finance or insurance, those type of vendors are definitely, but I, I think my focus right now is on freight tech companies because not only do they need the, the, the data and philosophy of the segmentation is that I'm available too to go over and, and help them out with the, their marketing and sales hints and tips uh, as much as possible because Joe, you sell someone, send some information, you want them to be able to use it and get the highest ROI uh, possible from it because uh, this is something that is 5, 10x possibility. And I'm there to, to help anyone to get to that, to get those numbers because they, they are realistic. We talked about the idea of our the freight brokerage space becoming just increasingly more sophisticated. Sales has become increasingly more sophisticated. It's not just, oh, here, grab the phone and just make a whole bunch of random phone calls. And then when people stop doing that, they said, oh, I don't have to make a, I don't have to make a hundred phone calls. I'm going to spam everybody on LinkedIn instead. Those are not the best approach. It, I'm not saying don't pick up the phone. I'm not saying don't use LinkedIn. But if you can have great insights and great research on the people who you're trying to sell to. And I know as you grow, you will continue to have better and better insights about what they're looking for. So when somebody says, Hey, Kev, I want to sell to the, I want to sell to freight brokers between this size and this size, who are they? And what is their pain points? You'll be able to go bang, bang. This is what you want to say when you talk to them. Exactly right. So it's, we were talking about sales versus consultants, right? You want to start your sales career as a salesperson and you want to, to finish it, transition over as a consultant and consultive sales is, is always the best. And, and being the market expert or owning a niche is important. And it's something that's doable for any salesperson. Yep. And again, we nobody wants to I'm not against salespeople. I am a salespeople. I always say people want to work with experts. That's what it comes down to. You don't want to be sold on something. You want to buy it because you go, ah, Kev, I want to buy that from you. Not because you're selling me on it, but because I believe what you're, I believe you are an expert and what you have is the solution to my problem. So anyway, final thoughts on the topic, Kevin Hill. It's a, it's a very interesting market when you kind of start breaking it down, the, the freight brokers, the 3PL market, and uh, it's always changing. That's the key. It's always changing. So there's some really battles. You mentioned TMS systems. There's some battles in that TMS world that is just interesting to, to see from afar is, is the battles and the arms rights that is going on with the integrations and AI coming out. So that I think that's the biggest trend. People are now talking about AI and what it exactly does. I'm still not sure. I think it's been around for a while even but it'll be interesting to see how everything plays out and how venture capital reacts over time. Yes, I love it. I love it. So I like to interview smart, interesting people like you, Kevin Hill, people who are killing it in the space. Who else should I talk to? One person is Dr. Mark Manera. He's doing supply chain fitness, growing that out and doing something else on driver health, blue collar health, really. That is really interesting. It has a great statistic that the, the average lifespan of a driver these days is 16 years less than the general population. So he's addressing that, which is, is fantastic. Another person actually is Paul Estrada, who, who's a shipper. He's been on both sides of the coin now, works for a large shipper. And when we talk about the table stakes of a 3PL and a true outsourced partners, he's got great insights on that as well. Oh, I love it. What, now, where's he work? Niagara. Oh, okay. Yeah, I would love to talk to him. I'm, I ring, That name rings a bell, and I'm wondering, I don't think I interviewed him. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm getting like you. You do so many interviews after a while, you go, yeah, that name rings a bell. Do I just know him somehow, or did I actually interview him? I, I know. Reminds me of Jeff Booth, too, over at Load Smart and Open Doc. I don't know if you've interviewed him. but Yeah, I did. I did interview him. Okay. He's got great insights on the warehouse market. Yes, I love that. Yeah, he was a great guy to talk to. Yeah, so everyone at Load Smart's great. 
yeah, they're one of those, they're one of those digital freight brokers where they started with the tech. So I'm sure they're on, I'm sure they're on your list. Kev, what conferences will we see you at? The Broker Carrier Summit coming up uh, October, I think it's 12th and 13th down in Tampa. Dan Lindsay, Linkage Logistics, just started putting those together. They're, they're fantastic. So I'll be speaking down there. I'll probably be out at TIA, the, the technology, in later that month in October, and then F3 in Chattanooga. Awesome. Awesome. Kevin, it's always a pleasure to talk to you and congrats on the new biz. I love what you're doing. Again, I think this is really proof that our industry's gaining a little bit of recognition. It, it, when people start writing about it, and by the way, I saw not so long ago, I'll have to look this up. It was an article, that's a number of years old, but it was saying how many of the for, Forbes 400 made their money in logistics. And that was like, at, for a long time, it was like one person. And then all of a sudden it was like <laughs> eight. And you're starting to see our companies listed in the uh, Fortune 500. It's starting to see some notoriety. The venture capitalists and private equity companies discovered the space in the last 10 years. So this is all, uh, it's very exciting because again, this one sleepy biz is all of a sudden being uh, modernized and uh, recognized. So good deal. Thank you, Kev. Thank you, Joe. It's always a pleasure uh, talking to you beyond the logistics of logistics, the first podcast I ever did. <laughs> That's right. You were my second guest. I I would say I'll put a link to that episode, but I, I'm a little embarrassed about it. So. <laughs> and our audio wasn't quite that great, was it? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, not quite there yet. <laughs> Yeah. And thank you, Kev. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You have been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage with leaders in the logistics and supply chain community. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, hit the like button, and leave us a nice review on Apple or Spotify or wherever else you listen. Also, please check out our videos on YouTube and connect with us on LinkedIn. We're very big on LinkedIn. And you can also reach us on the logisticsoflogistics.com, our website.